Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny Beatty, and the captain of one of the French sides who won in dramatic fashion in the Champions Cup last weekend will be joining us shortly as well. But we're going to have a quick chat about the Six Nations first because that's just over a week away now. And it's fair to say Fabien Galtier has had to deal with a fair bit of upheaval over the last week or so. He's had to make 11 changes to his squad because of COVID and injury. So... What's going on, Johnny? Have their preparations been affected badly or not? COVID, Tim. We're still yeah. talking about COVID. <laughs> um, it's the same old story. Uh, and it's the Toulouse ranks that have been ravaged. So you've got Dupont, Intermac, Bay, Co, Gelange. They've all got it. Um, so they haven't taken part in training camp. Um, does it change that much for them? Probably not. So they'll all be joining up again on Monday, basically. Yeah, exactly. So they'll play that game against Racing 92. You have to remember, a few of them have had COVID and a few games have been cancelled, so they probably need a couple of games under their belt before they make a tilt at the championship anyway. So it's not the worst thing. You just obviously touch wood, none of them pick up any last-minute injuries, um, but they will all play this weekend in the top 14 against Racing, and then they'll be straight back on a plane. So whenever they finish that game and lose the next morning, they'll be straight up to Paris to meet up with the squad and start prep properly for that first game against Italy. Yeah, Italy first up, which, without being too disrespectful, probably helps them a bit as well. Massively. Um you're not taking on England. You're not playing Ireland first up. Um, again, if you've got COVID in your ranks and a little bit of disruption without being disrespectful, like you said, Italy is the best team to get. So look, after that last win um, in Paris against the All Blacks, um, getting back to Paris, getting back into camp, getting settled and getting stuck into the tournament against Italy is probably the best way to start the competition. So um, I wouldn't be too worried yet. I mean, there's a couple of niggly injuries Um Jalibert still is not going to be there, but the, the depth of talent that they have and the players available, um, they should be set up nicely for that first test. And speaking of one of those Toulouse contingent who is missing with COVID at the moment, he is World Player of the Year, France captain, but even he can't pull off the gap. They put him in for GQ, <laughs> can he? What was going on? I, I, don't know, they, I definitely couldn't pull it off. The um, the yellow dressing gown was the first one I saw on his, his Instagram. It was the first to send messages and <laughs> the abuse he must be getting. And then the Givenchy, the Freddie Mercury in the second outfit. I'm not sure which one was worse, but to be <laughs> fair, it's water off a duck's back. He will not care. He'll have enjoyed it. He'll have laughed. Um, he'll have taken the abuse um, because he's just good with it. He takes it well. Um, and there's not many people that could pull it off either. And, and he did very well. So no fair play. It was absolutely disgusting attire given. I'm not <laughs> sure if that counts as high fashion or if it was taking the piss. Like, I honestly couldn't make up my mind, but he pulled it off well anyway. Let's just see. You and I probably aren't the right people to ask about high fashion, I reckon. But hey. Um, That's Benji Kayser and his gloves after the weekend. That's who we should ask. It was, it was a similar colour to those gloves as well. So. <laughs> the colour scheme. He's obviously gone to GQ. Ask them what's hot. Those gloves, my, my. I'm not sure if everyone saw it, but hilarious, amazing <laughs> stuff. And if Dupont is back against Italy, it probably won't affect his performance, but um, will they put a picture of that up on the dressing room wall? Motivation? What does, who does this guy think he is? Who, Italy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the French boys in their own team room to take the bad. I don't know, mate. Um, no, nah, look, I think there'll be lots of teams that will keep a special eye on him because the player is, they will not. Again, it'll be good to have a laugh about it after a game. Um, but no, they're, they're not going to be any... Any pictures on walls and reading of the riot act by coaches because he's in a, a yellow dressing gown? I think that'd be a step too far, <laughs> even for Antoine Dupont. We'll chat more about the Six Nations next week, but before we move away from it for now, we should let you know that the Guinness Pint predictor from Match Pint is back and the game is live now ahead of the opening weekend of matches next weekend. It's the same tried and tested format where you can predict the scores beat your mates and win pints of Guinness. All you have to do is pick the winner of each game and how many they'll win by. It's that simple. And you can go head to head with Johnny and Benji to prove you know more than them as well by just entering the lead code LaRugby once you've downloaded the Match Pint app. We'll be getting our predictions in next week, but the game's live now. So just check it out and join our league as well if you fancy taking part and winning some Guinness along the way. Let's just touch on Toulouse quickly before we bring our guest in because there was loads of drama on the pitch in the Champions Cup last weekend, but Toulouse were involved in some off the field after their game against Cardiff was called off by EPCR because of the number mm -hmm. of COVID cases in their camp. It's similar to the decision that Leinster faced before Christmas, they weren't happy either, but the French sports ministers got involved as well. So what on earth is going on? Um. 
Oh, it's very difficult because, as you mentioned, Leinster took it. It was a bitter pill to swallow, but it's happened. Um, the same has happened this weekend with Bordeaux and their game. They should have been traveling to Leicester, and Urios just kind of accepted. It was like, well, it's just the way it is. We'll move on. It's been a bit of a mess this year, but we're not gonna we're not gonna moan too much. Next job mentality. Whereas, I think Hugo Mola spoke in the French press this week, and it was more about how it was handled and the manner as opposed to the game actually being called off. Um, he treated it as being described or sorry, being treated with contempt by EPCR, which is a big word. It's a big, strong word when you're talking about a governing body. Um, and he just gave some brief data. That, Look, we were told the meeting was at eight to discuss it all. It was postponed. We sat around for two hours till 10 p.m. We told we'd get the result of the meeting five minutes after. We had to wait till 11 a.m. the next day. But then between those times, we find out that Cardiff knew all along the game was off. They've been told by people on the... So, you know, they feel they've been treated with contempt and they've been taking the piss out of it. And that's the point of difference. I'm not sure if it's actually the fact is that the game is off. It's more the manner of how they've been treated. They feel they've been treated like kids, um, which isn't cool. So I can understand from that perspective. But like Christoph Furios, I previously said, it has been a crazy European campaign. Um, there's been difficult things to accept and, and to lose like everybody, they, they have to accept it and get on. I think, again, if they had felt they'd been treated like contempt and then they hadn't made it through to the next round, it could have been all out war with the French government wading in, like you said. But fortunately, they've scraped through based on the games that they've won so far uh, and they advanced. But um, look, clearly, they're not happy. It's one thing for a coach or a club to be unhappy putting an appeal but for the French sports minister to contact EPC, I'd describe it as incomprehensible. That's a step above Leinster, isn't it? It's next level, but I think, I don't know, it's just been this year's tournament that there's been, and last year's tournament, there have been decisions that have been hard to digest and difficult to understand and moving goalposts. Unlike COVID, like the whole world has had to deal with in terms of getting on planes, working, not working, nobody really quite knows where they stand. Um, and it's been unsettling for everybody in every walk of life. And I think when you then add to that, they feel like you've been taking the piss out of, um, it's difficult. And that's where you go up a gear and, and you kick off massively and you, you get your local government involved. So look, it's not been easy. Um, it, hopefully, we mentioned last week, we hope this is the, the near end and we're nearly at the end of um, this COVID misery. Um, and hopefully for France, who are a month behind the UK, let's not forget in terms of cases and where they are, hopefully now we're about to turn a corner. Six Nations is back on. And the next level of European rugby in the round of 16, we hopefully won't be talking about it anymore. Right, let's get on to the far more positive drama on the field in the final round of pool games now. And Stade Francais were the story of the round after they came from behind and with 14 men as well to beat Connor by exactly the margin they needed to qualify. And we can have a chat now with Stade Francais captain Tala Gray. How are you doing? Hey, fellas. Thanks for having me on. I'm great, thanks. Thank thanks for coming on. How are the nerves? Have you recovered? Yeah, all good now. It was a bit of a high drama game there towards the end, but you know the boys are back, back at it, back training, back to the top fourteen competition now. So, well, that's look forward to. The grind continues, but let's go back to the weekend because I mean, drama. We've said about five times already in the podcast, and it was pretty dramatic, wasn't it? No, we went into that game, you know, with nothing to lose because earlier in the earlier rounds was we took forty points from Connacht. Um, we took two points here at home because um, Bristol didn't come over. And then we went over to Bristol. Although we put on a good performance, we didn't come away with any points. So we went into this game against Canucks going, guys, we need to give everything we can. You know, it's been seven years since we played in this competition. Uh, we need to make our mark and, you know, prove it to these guys that we belong in this competition. And it wasn't going to be easy because Canucks is a well-drilled team with, you know, quality players. And we went out there, threw the ball around. It's the only way we were going to score points. And we got a few points there at the start. It was a bit back and forth, back and forth. And then the drama with the red card. Um, but the boys pulled it up and played well to, to get that win in the end. And so do you think the red card was almost a stimulus for a positive reaction? Because the, I don't think the ref might have picked up what he said to Wayne Barnes, but like we could pick you up saying, oh mate, you were speaking French, like <laughs> you didn't understand. Although Barnes, he does speak French. So was that just quick thinking on your part trying to defend him? Did you actually pick up what he said? But generally it was a great reaction after that. Yeah, but the thing was, I was on the other side of the field when that all unfolded. 
So I'm still trying to catch my breath running over because I've seen Blows Whistle once and then saw him Blows Whistle again and I saw the red card come out. I'm like, oh no, what's happening here? So I'm thinking, oh, okay, we've got a red card. I want to I need to go see what's happening. As I'm jogging over, um, Wayne's got this serious look on his face and as he's explaining himself, um, I'm sure you've all heard what, what he said. I'm like, oh, geez, what do I say here? And because he's already sent him off, like I was trying to make light of the situation and I just said... I said, man, he's speaking French, but he has, was not having a bar of it. He looked me dead in the eyes and he goes, oh. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he's pretty serious here. So. He's like, mate, I've just seen you run from the other side of the field. <laughs> yeah, <Cut out. laughs> I was still trying to catch my breath by the time we got there. Yeah, back to your point about was it wasn't a stimulus. Yeah, 100%. Like, we knew we were in there with 14 guys. And we have did it once already this season. But to be fair, we've done it three times since I've been, since I've been at Stud where we've had a red card for over half the the game and the boys have come up on top. So, you know, we're not a stranger to do something like that. Um, and it was just fortunate that the results went our way. It's funny, isn't it, Johnny, on the red card, because in your new life of commentating, you used to apologizing for things picked up on the ref mic. The ref mic missed what Tolo Latu said. Wayne Barnes just repeated it as loud and clear as could be. <laughs> apologize for that. <laughs> Mate, there was no way. But I like I like what you've tried. I also like that you admitted it to us on this podcast. Now everybody knows. I think that's quality. Well done. Um, and on the game itself and the margin that you had to win by, you knew that before the, the game to, to stand yourself in good stead of, of potentially qualifying. French teams in the past have been guilty at times of not knowing what they had to do or perhaps making the wrong decision in the last couple of minutes. We won't mention Clermont, Benji's not here, but it's happened in the past. So just talk us through the mindset before the game. And I know you weren't on the field at the time, right at the end, but are you taking all the credit for winning exactly by six points? Like going into that game, like I said earlier, like our priority was just to win. Like we needed to get our confidence up. We needed to put in a big performance, a good performance, and just to win that game. And as the game was going on and it was getting closer and closer and we were, we were ahead in the last, say what, the last five, five minutes, I think it was. Yeah, that's when everyone was just screaming from the sidelines. Go for post, go for post. And then, yeah. But it was in the back of our minds, but that wasn't our focus at that stage. And in terms of the general performance, it seems a little bit of a step up. Like the first start part of the season had been a little bit shaky for you in a few different areas, but there's a few key guys come back from injury. Yourself, you're back in the mix. You've also got Nico Sanchez, who hasn't played in a long time. He certainly adds a different dimension to the way you play. So how big is it to get him back to form? Yeah, well, especially playing in a competition like the Champions Cup, it's just, it's another, it's another style, it's another level. And for a player like Nico, it suits his style of play. You know, he's, he's someone that plays what's in front of him, someone who's got quick hands, he's got quick feet. And as you saw on the weekend, like you give him, you give him a meter or two, or even less. That's quite a lot for Nico. You know, he'll he'll carve you up in in the centers. And to have Nico back um, with someone with his experience, um, just to someone that's level headed, someone that's real calm. And it's also it's real nice to have someone like that when everyone's panicking or everyone's talking. Just someone that's real calm, takes control of the situation, and just calms everyone down. So he's got a good good aura about him when he's on the field, which it showed on the weekend. He plays much flatter to the game line. Obviously, Yuri Seconds is a great kicking standoff, but plays fairly deep in the pocket and distributes quite deep. But then you look at the way Luamapi plays, the guys that he brought into the game on the game line and to be flattened up on the edge, he'll be fantastic for these guys to bring them up and, and get them closer to that game line, closer to defensive line in their faces. He'll be huge for your, your, your back line for the rest of the season. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you, you like Jaros, they're, they're two different tents. You know, like you said, like Jaros is one of the best kicking tens in the competition. And Nico is someone that plays right on the line, which gives um, the defenders no chance to to react to what someone like a YCL or someone like a Lomapi would do in front of you. So um, they both have their positives. They both have their, their strong points. Um, you know, it's always up to the coaches to to see who he wants to play for that weekend, which is a good problem for us to have. And Joris obviously did kick the, not the winning penalty, but the penalty to get you six points ahead right at the death. But the camera was on you when that initial penalty came off the pace. So talk us through what you're thinking. Mate, when he went for that kick, I was like, okay, I've seen Joris kick this a million times at training. Um, he can get this one. And from the angle we were looking at, it was going too far left. And I'm not sure if you'd seen it on the post, but everyone's going like this. Everyone's like, 
leaning over, and then it hit the post. So we all thought it went over. And anyways, when the ball rebounded and, and they caught it and they ran back, we were like, oh, I missed that one. But then, like, this is behind the scenes stuff. Like, I'm not sure you guys have seen it, but Nico has played 80 minutes. He's chased that kick all the way. He's made the tackle. He's got it back up. And he's gone again to try and charge the, the kick down. And obviously, that's when one of the players had him back. And then we got that penalty back. And that just goes back to, to the type of player Nico is. You know, he's... He's a little man, but he's got a he's got a he's a dog, you know. He's got a big fight in him. He's got massive heart, and obviously the manner of that win, it must have been amazing. So tell us, you had a decent celebration after the game, and you went out and toasted it in Paris. You know what? Like it was real satisfying to win the game because we had to also wait to see the results between the the Wasps versus Munster game. Yeah. So, after the game, we stuck behind and we watched the game together, took a couple of beers and, you know, once they came on top and then we're like, fellas, we're, we're, we're in there now. Uh, <laughs> you left, big... left and went out on the town yeah. at half time thinking, <laughs> we're in. Yeah. We're in there, fellas. Like, there's no real big celebrations. We're like, you know, we've got a short turnaround next week back in the top 14. So there's nothing too crazy, to be honest. Like, I love to say, yeah, we went and partied out all or not, but no, it, was, it wasn't too much. It was pretty mellow. Everyone, well, I went back home, had a good feed, and went to bed. It was a bit sore after that game, to be honest. So there was no trip to VIP. Devastating. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure if that place is still running, to be honest. Really? Oh, it's I, a great place. Yeah, yeah. there's some new up-and-coming ones. What, that's what I've heard from all the young fellas. So. <laughs> of course, you've never been. Because your missus listens to the podcast. Get yeah. that in. Yeah. <laughs> And talk to us generally about Stad because it's been an up and down season, obviously a high at the weekend, but um, I guess it's the search for consistency, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's been our problem for, for a while is consistency. You know, we can start well in the season and then drop off mid season. Um, but that's just the area we're trying to, we're trying to work on right now is to, to, to get consistent performances every week. Um, the, the past two weeks, we've put in consistent performances, but not consistent results. So that's something we, you know, we need to play well and win the games also. So um, it's going to be another big test this weekend. You know, we got, we got Toulon at home. Um, I, know, I know they're up for it because they haven't played a game. Well, they played one game in the last, I don't know, uh, four weeks um, with all the cancellations and stuff. Um, I know they, they flew up to Paris to start their prep on Monday as well. They're camping out in Paris all week. So that's when you know a team is real serious about that game is when they've gone up a week early to prepare for the game. Um, so that was another reason we were no one, you know, got ahead of themselves after the game because we knew Toulon's a different, it's a different, uh, it's a different team. It's a bigger team, you know, different style. Um, so we're just trying to take it a week, a week by week, and just try and have consistent good performances. Um, hopefully we can continue that into this week. And the, the work that goes into those performances, the performance side, and also the ownership, like recently in top 14, it's all changed. It used to be Max Guazzini, now it's Dr. Wild. You've got Toma Lombard, that's the director. You've got Gonzalo Caseda. Can you give us a little bit on the sort of backdrop of the club, what it's like as a, as a place to go and work? I think you're our first guest from, from Stad. So it'd be good to get a little bit of insight into how the club operates, the type of characters you've got behind the scenes and how it all works. So when I arrived 2000, I want to say 18, 2000, the 2018-19 season, um, they had a whole different board of directors. Like there was a different um, president. Um, obviously there was Dr. Wild, the owner. Um, with the new coaches, obviously that was the, oh, well, I don't want to say a shambles that year, but, you know. Was that the, that, was that the Heineken mayor era? That's it, that's it. So obviously, because the following season, you know, like eight guys were shown the door. So um, since then, we've had a pretty consistent um, coaching crew, and also with to um, Thomas coming into the taking taking charge, um, which I've, I find is doing a great job over there, um, especially with um, Gonza and the two the two coaches in um, Julian Aziz and Lolo Samperi. They're they're two young coaches. Um, you know, it's like it's only their second season in. Um, but it's also good to have them there because they're young coaches who are willing to learn and we bounce and um, bounce off each other. And, you know, they take feedback really well. 
and which is working well. Well, the two guys you mentioned, uh, Son Perry and Arias, they are, you know, they're part of the fabric of the club. They've been there for over a decade, I think, both of them. Um, they've been massive players for the club. The other one I want to pick your brains a little bit more about is Gonzalo Caseda, who was part of the coaching staff for a long time. He's been part of the French coaching staff as well. I think the 2015 World Cup. He since left, went back with Argentina. He's now back at the club. And obviously the way you played has completely changed again from the mayor era to how you play now. So in terms of a coach and his philosophy, what's he like? Gonza is someone that works real well or tries to build relationships in, inside a team, which is, the, you ask any successful club, you know, uh, they're a tight group of guys, you know, and that's what he's trying to create at the club. He's trying to create that culture of, Guys wanting to be at the club, you know, um, hanging around with each other. And I feel that we're still heading in the right direction. We're not there yet, um, but I feel that's a culture he's brought over and it's something we can keep working on still. And I feel soon enough it will, it will, it will be fruitful. And how big a part do you play in that as well? You're captain at the weekend. Do you kind of galvanising the troops? Do you host loads of dinners for 30, 40 guys in your house? or? Yeah, we, we've got a good core group of, of um, we've got a good leadership group. There's about four or five of us. Um, well, I took the reins on the weekend, but um, our main captain is Paul Gabriak, um, a young Parisian. He's been there since he was a kid, you know. And so what other great captain to have than someone that's been at the club since he could walk. Um, and he's a great leader. He's a great player also. Um, but in terms of like team events, and that's something that's real tough here in Paris to do. You know, everyone lives so far out, um, lives in different places. Although we do have our dinners and stuff together, but I'm not sure how much of Paris you know, but majority of the boys, they all live in apartments um, here in Paris. And to have 40, 50 guys over <laughs> in an apartment is a bit tough to do. So, and on top of that, when we find a um, good restaurant to go to, um, it's not cheap by any means. So, you know, it is um, it is tough. It has its... Uh, Challenges living in Paris and having um, team camaraderie and a lot of team functions, um, but you know it's it's Paris. Surely Doctor Wild picks at the tab, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a few times that's for sure. And and obviously that's a real stark contrast to your previous clubs. So you've obviously played back in Australia, but coming over to Biarritz and Toulouse, it's much easier to form those cultural bonds because of the town and the sort of the strength of the bond you have with the town it is massive behind those teams. Beerits, you get 20,000 people. Toulouse, you get 20,000 people rocking up for games. And you feel like there's a real, you're almost embedded in the towns that you play in. Obviously, that must be different in Paris because it's such a big town. Um, but there's also the flamboyance, you know, pink jerseys, Max Guazzini you used to have circus animals on the field before the warm-ups and stuff. You'd bring lions and things out onto the field when Benji Kayser was there like incredible scenes. Is there still that element of flamboyance and romanticism that we get when we think of Stade Francais or is it much more professional now? I can't, I can't speak for when um, Benji was there with uh, Max and, you know, we've all seen pictures, we've all seen videos and, you know, just, that was entertainment, right? Like he changed the fabric of, of, of entertainment for rugby. Um, no, there's not much of that at the moment at, at the Stade, you know, like, I think it's a lot more professional now as compared to, to before. Although I wouldn't say it, was, it wasn't professional when Max took over, you know. He changed the game for Stade Francais, he put him on the map. So, um, like you said earlier, um, living in Biarritz or living in smaller towns, it's, it's so much easier to, to create those, those, those cultural bonds when you can do something together like every second day, you know. Whereas here, it's, you got your traffic, you got like a restaurant or, or someone's house that you can't even get to like you could if you're living in Biarritz because the majority of the boys live in houses. And how involved is Dr. Wild? Because he might not be bringing lions and tigers to games, but he, he, we spend quite a lot of time talking about owners on here. We've had Zach Mercer on recently talking about Mohad Altrad. There's some big characters involved in other clubs at ownership level. Just give us an insight into what Dr. Wild is like, how involved he is. Yeah, like, um, who can compare him to? Like, when I was in Biarritz, we had Serge Blanco. He's not as involved as Serge Blanco was when I was there. Like, you know, Serge was there all the time. But he's not going to come in at halftime, um, Dr. Wild, and give you a pump-up speech. But he will come to, like, a game 
once in every, I don't know, like four weeks, you know, he's pretty supportive. He's always there. Um, he doesn't necessarily um, give you the pump up speeches that other presidents would do. Um, he's sort of behind the scenes. Um, when we have like preseason camps, he's always there. He always makes the effort to come and see us, you know, during the week, you always pop in to say hi, you fly in for the afternoon and you'll fly back over to Germany. So yeah, I would say he's pretty involved, but in terms of the rugby side of things, um, in terms of like our game plans and stuff, no, he's, that's the guy who can do that. And Johnny mentioned you played for Beeritz and Toulouse before. I think you were only 21 when you moved over to Beeritz from Australia. So did you see yourself still being in France nearly a decade later? Uh, and I guess it's a funny thing or rugby and where it takes you in life. Um, I, I'm, I'm from, I'm from, I'm a Samoan kid from Victoria, Melbourne, Victoria, in the northern suburbs of um, Broadmeadows. And for those who don't know Melbourne or Victoria very much, it is purely AFL, purely AFL. There's, there's no rugby, especially at the time when I was there, you know, growing up like in the 2000s, early 2000s and stuff. So I was playing rugby over there, um, you know, it's, playing with my friends and stuff. And I was fortunate enough to get a, to get an academy gig over in Canberra. So I was down there for three seasons and then picked up a gig over there in, in Biritz. And I was a, well, like you said, yeah, 21 year old. And as naive as I was, like, I didn't know anything about Biritz, especially at that time. Like we, the, the top 14 wasn't televised in, in Australia. So my agent came over to me, he goes, you know, you got no bites, no one wants you. Why don't you just go overseas and play for a season and then come back? And I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good. Idea. And then, as I was saying earlier, like I got there a week later, the Roxy Pro was on. Like I didn't even know it was on. It was on the water. You know what I mean? Like the actual <laughs> city is on the water. And I get there and I had the time of my life. You know, it was amazing being over there. Met some awesome people. I was only meant to be there for a season, and then I I asked to stay for an extra season. And then, um, you know, I wanted to keep the dream alive and come and play for the Wallabies. So I tried to go home for another two seasons. Um, that didn't really work out in my favour. I only played two games in two seasons. I'm not going to complain about that because it was like a learning curve for me. And if I never went back home, I never would have met my partner also. So um, and then I came back over in Toulouse and been fortunate enough to be here in Paris. Johnny, talk us through the Roxy Pro. It must be pretty good if it keeps someone there for a decade, let's go. <laughs> 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 it'll pull you back now the Roxy Pro is the massive surf tournament um, which yeah. is staged between Birit sometimes in Hossegore uh, normally in October when the sun is still shining and it's just an unbelievable event big party um, lots of ridiculously good looking people walking around with not too much on what's not to like it's one of the best things so mate it's not too late you can move back like me I'm still here I get there over October with my sunglasses on my wife doesn't say anything it's alright you're allowed <laughs> Um, it, was, it was just a great introduction to, to <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's not there's not many better introductions it's it's yeah. an amazing event um and yeah something that has to be seen and again it's not known that's the crazy thing like again you talking about coming from australia me coming from scotland like we, i didn't know where beer it was but See? it's just this stunning part of the world um <laughs> that's still unspoiled crazily um a beautiful little spot so mate you still obviously got time in your contract but would you see yourself trying to orchestrate like i did that was my <laughs> main aim towards the end of my career I was trying to orchestrate and move back to the southwest and back to the beach that's where I wanted to finish would you try and do the same yeah I, like that's any rugby player's dream as I was saying earlier is to is to retire and finish down um in a beautiful spot especially for for a great club also like the periods or a on um that would be the dream but you know you never know what rugby has plans for you you know I could end up in in Scotland you know you never know well, they could do. They don't have the Roxy Pro they, in Glasgow. They don't have the Roxy Pro, I'll tell you that. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned international aspirations. I know that Dave Rennie and Scott Johnson, they've really widened the net in who they're looking at. Have you had any contact? Because they've obviously contacted quite a few different people, people with like residencies, loads of different rule changes. You obviously qualify because it's your, you, you've grown up there. Have you, have you had any contact from Dave Rennie and the, and the coaching team? So, so before I left to come to... To be right, I played I played sevens for Australia for for a whole for a whole season for a whole one. Um, so tied. And um, so when I left, obviously I was tied to Australia, and I was trying to play for Samoa after that. So I wasn't eligible to play for them until until now, like until the the, the recent changes in the rules. 
and I was fortunate enough to get a phone call from Selala Makusu. He is the coach of the Samoa. Amazing. Asked me if I was keen, and man, I jumped on that. I, it was the it was the yes. game against um, the Barbarians. Sorry, so it was it was before the rule came in, and it wasn't counted as a cap. So I was eligible just to go and play, and just to represent Samoa once. It, was, it would have been a dream for me. And I went to go play, and then during that week on camp, they changed the rules, saying there's a, a three-year stand-down period, but it's been like, I don't know, seven years for me. And I was eligible to play for Samoa. And whether I get picked now or not, um, that would be pretty cool. Um, but, yeah, now I'm eligible. Now I can actually play international rugby if I'm, if I'm, if I'm chosen. Hey, that's amazing. And you talked about your desire, but surely now with the World Cup in 2023 being hosted in France, that would be unreal. Oh, man, it would be amazing, it's especially playing for Samoa as well. Because that week I had the Barbarians or for Samoa when we were about to play the Barbarians was one of the best rugby weeks of my life. Like, you know, it wasn't like a Barbarian week where, you know, you head out and you're on the drink with the boys every every night. It was just a great, um, it was a great week to just reconnect with my culture, being Samoan and stuff and being with the other Samoan boys, like, I'm sure you know if you're in the Scottish team. It's just it's a different kind of uh, atmosphere. And have you spoken to other people who are maybe in the same boat with Samoa as well? Because obviously you mentioned the rule change. There's a group of people who may be changing their allegiances. So do you know if other people are in the same boat? Like I know, I'm not in the Samoan team personally, no. Um, but like I play with with Nani, and Nani's put up his hand to Nani Lamaka has put up his hand to play for Tonga. Um, he's pretty excited about that. It's just that he's got another extra year or two stand down period. So I'm not sure where it's happening with that. It's incredible. But also, again, your story is like so many others people that have been tied um, and, and life moves on and you move to the other side of the world and, and your priorities change, but then a chance to reconnect with your country, with your culture, and represent your country on a world stage. Um, man, it's cool. I'm all for it. I think it's a great rule change. I'm also really glad. I thought there might have been a few people abusing it and trying to work their way into other teams for different reasons, but it seems so far everyone is doing it for the right reasons, which is really important. Um, so no, mate, power to you. I think that's awesome. It'd be great to watch you play for Samoa and to do it here um, in a World Cup on French soil would be even cooler. So no, mate, well done. Love it. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Hey, like we said earlier, like it's funny how our rugby careers, you know, where it can take us and look what it is now so we never know what can happen further down the, the track um but you know try and take it week by week hopefully you've got a good few years left in your playing career yet johnny's already trying to drag you down to the south of france to play for Biritz or Bayonne before you're done but have you thought about after that have you will you stay in france will you go back to australia do you know what you want to do after playing like um you never know look I, i'm still in france now like, it would be easy for me to say, yeah, I'm going to pack up and leave and go back home. But, you know, something can pop up in a year or two or, like, in six months. Um, but at the moment, like, would I dearly head home? You know, like, family has been, uh, been a big reason why we want to go back home. Like, I've got little nephews who are growing up, like, they're nine years old and I left the ready even born sort of thing. Um, so we've got family that we want to head home to. And... At the moment, I'll say we're going to pack up and leave, but you just never know. Like, we could be here. We could have a, we could speak in 10 years and we're still here. And Mr. JB, he'll come up with a business opportunity and um, you'll be down in the south of France before you yeah, know. Exactly, right. Yeah, all, all, all I know is you're definitely not going to be at the Roxy Pro in Glasgow, um, but you're welcome <laughs> down this way anytime. You're absolutely welcome. Uh, mate, I want to ask you randomly, I forgot to ask you. So, Obviously, local rivals, very easy to travel. Um, but would you have rather played against a different team, like a foreign team again for a different type of game? Or are you pumped to be playing against them in the next round and hopefully knocking them out? Like, I, I'm pretty, it's it's pretty easy to get up to play against Rossi. Like, you don't need much to to play against those boys. And, and it's the same, I can say it's the same for them, for us, you know, like such a big derby, such a big history there. And, and, the boys are just going to be up for it, which is it was just it's massive for us, you know. They knocked us out last year, and then they beat us again in the first round this year. So we got we got a lot to prove again against those boys, um, especially just 
being across the road. Gonzalo used to coach there as well, didn't he? So is there always a bit of extra spice for him in those yeah, weeks? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I can forget that he actually used to coach there. Because I was in Biarritz when he was coaching down there. But no, he doesn't. He doesn't say too much about them. You know, he's all step on state now. Well, he's won a title with us, so. How much mixing goes on between two sides socially? Like obviously, there's a big distance between your training grounds, between stadiums, but rugby players in Paris, a lot of the French age grade guys must know each other or have grown up in Paris. Like, is there a bit of crossover? Are there, are there mates in the opposition side or, or not too much? Um, well, for for us, um, like the foreigners, yeah. No, like our, like all our partners and stuff, they're all pretty close. Um, we have a <laughs> we have a local Aussie cafe down the road called Oak Coffee that everyone goes to so we bump into them all the time and we see them there all the time like all our partners do stuff together like the the other australian partners who are over there and the irish partners as well so yeah there's a bit of crossover um mainly from our partners like most of the time we're training whilst they're all catching up so yeah so when it when it comes to the first week of april do you have to say to your other half please don't talk to kirtley's other half i know we're giving them any info (laughs) They, they have a little bit of rivalry between the girls themselves, but you know, it's, no, it's nothing like that. There'll be no Aussie coffee shops that week. That's what's yeah, being yeah, said. We're yeah. not going to the coffee shop. Yeah, it's not yeah, happening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Tyler. And um, great to hear about the developments with Summer as well. And a massive good luck when it comes to April and that big Paris derby in the Champions Cup. I appreciate that, fellas. Thanks for having me on, eh? Hopefully we speak soon. Pleasure, mate. Good luck this weekend against Toulon as well. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys. Great to have Tyler on and really good to hear he's potentially going to be at the World Cup in 2023. Amazing. Look, look, he's a top bloke um, and he has been superb in the top 14 with Biarritz and Toulouse and now Stade Francais, but that is the cherry on top. And, you know, asking about Australia, me being naive, um, I didn't realise he'd met up with someone been part of that camp because obviously didn't get on the field and the game didn't go ahead. Um, but so good. Um, and again, I mean, so much to him, but to represent his country, like we said, but to do it in France, you know, pick up games for Samoa in Toulouse, in Bordeaux, um, in towns that he knows with his family over here and playing for Samoa um, will be extremely cool for him. So no, really chuffed um, that he shared that with us um, and great that he's now kicking on after injury and, and playing some really good stuff with um, Stade Francais as well. Let's just touch on a couple of other big Champions Cup stories now then. We had him on the show a while back, and he is a mate of yours from back in the day as well. Will Cast feel aggrieved they're not in the knockout stage after Mike Adamson's decisions towards the end? It was the TMO as well, Brian McNeese. Yeah, um, I well, yes, is the obvious answer. I think that they will feel aggrieved. Um, that being said, Mikey's decision on field was no try, which has been overturned by the TMO. Um and again, when you looked at it, like watching the game live, there was nothing really clear about the grounding. So to have turned that over and to have won the game in that manner or for Cast to have lost the game in that manner is extremely disappointing. Um, but look, I think the way they, they didn't take a hammering, but they didn't perform well against Harlequins at home um, before New Year. Um, that was a massive step up in terms of intensity, in terms of performance. And to go to Quinns and take them right to the very last minute like that it's huge for them. Um, and, and again, knowing some of the coaching staff and knowing some of the guys behind the scenes, they, they don't always believe that when they go over to Munster, they go to Quinns, they get the rub of the green. But when they go and they perform like that, they can win anywhere. Um, and so it's a big positive for them. Hugely disappointing to, to lose the game like that. Um, no getting away from it. But I think that'll be a good shot in the arm as they look ahead to the top 14 games they've got coming up um, and a real confidence boost because they performed very, very well. And you were in Montpellier, Johnny. We didn't talk about your weekend, but <laughs> to see them go from conceding 89 points one week, next week, beating X2 with a bonus point, qualifying for the knockout stages, pretty good. Oh, it was incredible. Um, and incredible to what, again, the position that I get to sit and watch these games as a reporter, like you're, you're right in between the two benches. So you get all the live reactions, you see how much it means to them. And from Montpellier, again, chatting to Felix Saint Andre before the game, having had the pants pulled down, which is how he described it last week. To turn that around, make 13 changes and then beat Exeter convincingly, who were European champions two years ago, um, is enormous for them. Um, And again, we had Zach Mercer on a couple of weeks ago. He talked about the importance of the competition. But again, just displaying what you're about as a club um, and a humiliation. Yes, you're at Leinster. Yes, you get academy kids out. But 
a score like that is horrific. So to have come back to have beaten Exeter and been convincing, like the way they defended Paul Valemsi was absolutely slamming. Boy, he is a monster. Kobas Reinach, the, the injection in the game that he added when he came on and, and killed the game off with his interception. Zach Mercer, again, the way he performed um, some of the offloads and things that he was throwing out of contact. And the way they shackled Exeter's attack was actually really, really impressive. Um, so that's a huge game um, and a huge win for them because it was difficult last week. Humiliation in French press, in European press, rugby-wise, um, and back on track. By the right direction, also guys that needed to come back and play after not playing for three, four, five weeks because of COVID. Again, we're talking about it again, but Mohamed Was. Um, Paul Valemsi, these guys needed to come back, get game time under their belts and be convincing for Fabian Galtier before they go away for the, the Six Nations tournament. So, no, it was a very, very impressive performance by them at the weekend. And we'll obviously look ahead to the round of 16 much nearer the time. But just looking at their game against Quinns and that matchup, it's one they might fancy a bit because um, the size of the Montpellier pack against Quinns, we know how good Quinns are, but it's yep. an interesting clash of styles. No, I, I think um, clash of styles, the way Quinns have when they have easy possession and they're on their ball and you have Marcus Smith um, pulling the strings. But I think when you look at Montpellier's pack and what they did to Exeter and how they, it's the power in the game line. When you have Jan Serfontaine, when you have Paul Vilemsi, um, when you have Zach Mercer, Camara, again, Yakuba Camara, the way he played at the weekend. Again, so big, so physical. I mean, that's going to be the difference against Harlequins. It's whether Harlequins can live with Montpellier's physicality. Um, and Exeter couldn't at the weekend. So that's what you get in France. It's what you get in the top 14 is the biggest, best athletes playing week, week in, week out. And again, Montpellier just showed at the weekend they can smash Exeter if they want. And again, we'll talk about it later in a few weeks' time, but they absolutely will fancy themselves to go through after that humiliation. It's a bizarre way to go through and, and to move on in the competition, but they absolutely can beat Harlequins in the next stage. Right. It's about time we did our meter moment of the week, isn't it? So take it away, Johnny. Well, we just spoke about it. Oh, um, that, is it? It well, has to be. <laughs> okay. I mean, how, how, where, where else do you see a comeback like that? Um, yeah. You don't. To, to have shipped nearly 90 points in one weekend to then hammering, hammering the European champions from two years ago. Um, and, and again, Rob Baxter was full of praise at the final whistle for how good they were and how well they played because they were excellent in every single domain, whether it was scrum time, line-out time, organizational, defense, the speed with which they, ex with which they executed their game, um, they were phenomenal. So my meter moment of the week is the performance of Montpellier coming back after that pummeling away to Leinster and shipping 90 points and beating Exeter this weekend in the Champions Cup. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer. They've made over 9 million cooks better with their revolutionary app as well. So it's no surprise their users are growing rapidly every day. If you've ever said your pork or turkey's dry, then meter's for you. And you can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. Enter a whole new world of cooking and join the metaverse at meter.com. And just use the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout for 10% off any full price item as well. Let's just have a very quick look ahead to the return of the top 14 this weekend now, because there are some massive games, aren't there? And none bigger than the bottom two going head to head. Johnny, what's going to happen? Honestly, two really well-balanced sides. Um, and that is a, a, such a big game for both Breve and Beeritz in the bargain basement. Um, Look, Breve have not been playing well uh, at all. Um, and they've lost a few on the trot. Beerits actually have been performing well and just not getting results at all. Um, oh, I'm going to go for an away win. I'm going to go for Beerits winning that. In, I mean, that's huge. Um, but I just think the way they've played, if they've got everyone fit and they get their personnel right on the field this weekend, Beerits could sneak, sneak that brief. Um Again, that'd be a bit of condemnation for Breve because I'm fairly sure they have played more games. They've played one more game than Beerits. Um, but yeah, I can see Beerits sneaking a little something in Breve. Interesting. And some big games at the top as well. Uh, massive. And again, there's going to be a fairly tricky period for the clubs to negotiate. There's going to be lots of double and lots of double weekends with COVID games being rearranged and, and catch-up fixtures being played midweek. Um, but Bordeaux... Um, didn't get to play last weekend against Leicester. You'd fancy them at home against Cast. Uh, La Rochelle, 
again, Montpellier coming to town, La Rochelle, we haven't talked about them, but they were really impressive in Glasgow. Um, absolutely demolished Glasgow. Again, that depends what side Montpellier send to La Rochelle. Um, Perpignan at home against Lyon. You think Perpignan might be struggling the way they've been playing. Toulouse, who'll have all the internationals back and fit and hopefully COVID-free uh, against Racing. You'd pick Toulouse at home. Um, and another big one, actually, is Poe at home to Clermont. You think the way if, Poe, if Clermont can play the way they played in the last 15 minutes against Ulster, they could blow Poe off the pitch. Um, so that could be another banana skin for Poe at home to Clermont. And then the big one, this weekend, I'll be out working that game for Premier Sports, Stade Francais against Toulon. Toulon, who are in a pickle, they have played, they've only played 12 games, but they find themselves 12th and they need to win. Um, and Stade Francais, again, 10th. If they win this weekend, they can nearly get up to just outside the top six. So <sighs> massive, massive game. Um, and as we mentioned, they have been in camp up there all week since Monday. <sighs> well, we've had Talagher on the podcast. Nico Sanchez is back <laughs> in the mix. So I'm going to back Stad Francais to do the job at home against Toulon. Donnie, we had Zach Mercer on the podcast and they shipped 89 points the week later. <laughs> <laughs> Tala, good luck. Um, we will touch on those games next week when we come back. And also we'll be looking ahead to the Six Nations, which obviously we can't wait for, eh? It's going to be huge. It's going to be a crazy few weeks with travel, with games. But the good news is crowds are back. We'll be back. Crowds Benji will be just, back. Benji will be back <laughs> next week as well. He's been MIA. Um, but that's it. Crowds have only just been lifted in the next week from 5,000 in France. So it's only just for the Six Nations. And they're now trying to sell all the tickets to get everyone in and get bums on seats. So if you fancy a travel, get over to one of the games in Paris. If not, it's just going to be insane. It's the best rugby tournament in the world, in my opinion. And I cannot wait to get stuck in. Absolutely. Massive weekend of the top 14 this time around. Next week, we'll look ahead to the Six Nations. Can't wait. Thanks, Johnny. A big thanks to Tala Gray for joining us as well. Thanks to all of you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye.